Have you ever promised your kids or your grandkids ice cream or something of the, of the sort after a difficult doctor's appointment or medical appointment, dentist appointment? Uh, it's, it's one of those things that Ron and I didn't mean to start this, this ritual, this precedent, but uh, we did where, okay, if you, if you go to this appointment and get your blood drawn, get your shots, have this MRI, this, this EEG that is not comfortable by any stretch, there will be something on the other side that will be exciting. There will be something good on the other side. And if, uh, I'm not sure if that's the best parenting strategy, but it's, it is one that's been helpful to our kids in preparation for some difficult things that they certainly didn't want to, to endure or go through. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, you know what? i got to have Pastor Josh take me to my next doctor's appointment. <laughs> That doesn't sound so bad. But, that, but that, that rule only applies to Ethan and Kinsley, and sometimes Rana. So, but with that, I, it's interesting how knowing that something else is coming, something good, that there's a light at the end of that tunnel, that dark tunnel, can give us, can give us strength, can give us courage to, to go through things that we never would have thought we could have endured. I'm sure if we went around the room, we could talk about things that each of us have gone through that we never would have thought we could have made it through the other side of. But there's, if there's something about hope that even just a small glimmer of hope that can carry us through even the, the most challenging things that we face in this life. But this morning, I, I'm not here to, to share with you the power of positive thinking or wishful thinking or some sort of useful fiction that if, okay, maybe it's not true, but this will just help you kind of get through things, so let me, let's just pretend that this were true. But I'm, I'm here this morning to share with you a real hope that there is real hope that you can cling to in difficult times that will carry you through. That there is a light that will, is shining into the darkest places that you find yourself in in this life. And that if you will embrace it, or rather if you will embrace him, that he will carry you through the darkest tunnels that you find yourself going through in this life. As a pastor, I, I'm occasionally contacted by a local funeral homes in the area to do a service for a family that doesn't have a home church. And I, I recall last year, uh, one in particular, where the funeral home reached out to me, said this family, uh, they don't live locally, but the gentleman who passed did. And they, they don't attend church, but they just want someone to officiate. I said, I'm more than happy to connect with them. And so I called the family, and I spoke with the daughter who was making the arrangements, and she said right off the bat, we are not a religious family, and we don't want someone to preach at us. And it's so it just it struck me because I really wanted to, to minister to this family in this difficult time, and that uh, her, her father had been, had been ill for many years, and it just was a really difficult time, long period of time for this family. And, but they didn't want someone to preach at them. They, they weren't interested in religion whatsoever. And I, but I wanted to minister to them, but I didn't know. I'm like, I'm not just saying this as a pastor because it's what I'm supposed to say or what I should say, but... Aside from the hope of the gospel, I have no hope to offer. I have nothing else to give you. If I can't talk to you about Jesus, if I can't share with you from God's word, I have no hope that I can give you. I can give you a hug. I can listen to you. I can empathize with you. I can pray for you from a distance. But if I can't give you Jesus, I have no hope to offer you. There's no alternative. There's nothing that's second place, a close second. 
literally I have nothing to give. And so what I, what I shared with this woman is I said, I, I promise you I will not preach at you. But I am a Christian pastor, and what I will bring will be a message of comfort and hope that is rooted in and comes from Scripture. I'm gonna t- I would, if you are comfortable with me doing it, if not, I understand it. It's okay. I would love to do it, but if I do, I will share Scripture. I'll talk about Jesus. I will pray, but I will not preach at you. And frankly, I thought she would say no thanks and, and move on to reach out to another uh, to someone else to to ordain to um, officiate the service, but but she, but she she said no. I I I'd like for you to do it. It really caught me off guard, and I, I remember going into that service just praying that what I would share, and I read scripture, I shared from scripture, I talked about Jesus, I prayed, but just praying that they would be open to hear that I would be as as empathetic and as comforting as I can be while being faithful to the truth and faithful to God's word and giving them the only hope that I had to offer. And of course, afterwards they thanked me for the service and I I didn't know how sincere that might be until about five months later, I got another call to officiate another family member's service from that same family. And that even though they didn't believe at that point, as I believe, there's something about Jesus that offers true hope unlike any other. It, it, it's, it's in what he alone gives, what he alone accomplishes, what he alone offers. It's in who he is. There is real hope. And it is, his name is Jesus. I want to share one more story with you before I turn to the to the before we turn to the text we're going to look at. And uh, Randy, if you wouldn't mind going back a slide for a moment, but it, it, it's with reference to another funeral that I officiated, and I offered. Uh, it was a difficult scenario just due to the events surrounding the death, and I I, I brought a a message of of, of hope and comfort again, rooted in God's word, and everything is going well in the service. I brought the message. We had a time of sharing eulogy. We we were up to the closing song. After that song, I was going to come up and pray, and we were going to go out to our meal. Afterwards, everything was going as planned. And then someone, a young man, stumbled into service late. And he was clearly distraught and came in with this burden on his chest. And he, he came up to me and approached me during that last song and, and said he needed to share. And he was a member of the family. And I was, while I was concerned about what this might do to the service, as we're, it's already nicely closing out, and I don't know what he's going to say, but I feel like I need to give him this opportunity to share what's on his heart. And so I did. And he came up to, the, to this very podium, and he just unloaded all of his grief and his pain and, his, and the despair that he had been living in and the questions and the doubts and, and all that he had just been carrying and burying on him. Um, all that he had been had bore on himself this great weight, and he went on and on, and this whole time I'm just I'm just praying, saying, God, I don't know what I'm going to offer in a response, but it needs a response. We can't. The service can't end here. It deserves a response, and so the whole time as he was going, I, I was praying, up until when I stood up and walked to this podium, didn't even know what would come out of my mouth as I opened it, just prayed that God would lead me as I offered a response. And this morning's message is largely my response to him that I offered there in that moment.
See, we all, we all experience, not just at one point in time, but at many points in time in our lives, we all wrestle with these questions, with these difficulties of, God, what are you doing? Why would you do this or allow this? Or do you see what's going on? Do you care? Are you capable? Do you hear? What are you doing? We all come to these points in life where we struggle and wrestle. We have this burden, as this young man did. But one of the things about, one of the, things about the God of Scripture is that he is, it is only in the God of Scripture that we have a God who truly knows human suffering. You see, in, it's not just that he knows of it because he's heard about it. He hears people, you know, complaining or crying about it. It's not just that he knows because he sees or because he's read all the books on the topic. It's not just that he knows about human suffering because he created our nervous system and our, our, our neurons and our sensory receptors or because he's created our psyche and so he understands what suffering is. He, the God of Scripture knows human suffering because he willingly stepped into it himself. It is only in the God of Scripture that we have a God who knows all about pain, all about rejection, all about injustice, all about temptation and difficulty and unfairness. It is only in Jesus that we have a God who knows, a God who empath empathizes truly and sincerely because he willingly stepped into human suffering. There is no parallel in any other world religion to what we see in Christ. And to, to stop and realize that the God of all creation, the, as, as the Apostle John says, the eternal Logos, who created all that was brought into being, that he stepped into his own creation, that he holstered his invincibility to step into human flesh and blood, to feel and walk through suffering and pain and difficulty. The Apostle John writes in the opening to his biography, his biographical work, his gospel account on the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus in John 1.14, he says, The Word, referring to Jesus, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling amongst us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and John always uses, uses this first plural, that we have seen his glory. We have seen him. He, he came down. He dwelt amongst us. We ate with him. We walked with him. We heard him. We touched him. And that he, that same God who created all things, he came down. It is only in Jesus that we have a God who truly knows and understands well, well, this morning's message technically is not part of the sermon series we started last Sunday. There is a, a point of connection here I want to quickly make. Last Sunday, as we looked at the story of Babel in Genesis 11, we talked about, in looking at the background and the context, we com compared and contrasted the, the, the pagan, man-made gods of the, of the ancient Near Eastern religions and compared and contrasted that with the God of Scripture. And one of the things that we looked at and talked about, one of the vast differences and distinctions was in the, that all of these pagan man-made gods, they all have needs. They all hunger and thirst and get tired. They all uh, were man-made representing the, the needs of the men who made them, who, who made them up. Whereas the God of Scripture has no needs and doesn't create to have his needs met but is fully self-sufficient. And here in Jesus, what we see is him willingly choosing 
to step into his own creation, that to, to, to come to his own creation who he loved, and that though he, he came to his own, they didn't recognize him. They didn't receive him. And he suffered for us of his own free will choice. It is only in Jesus that we have a God who truly knows and sees and a God who can sincerely say, as Jesus does in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, where he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, come to me all who are weary, all who are burdened and broke down, all who are, are devastated, all who are just worn out by all the anxieties of life. See, one of the things that, and I shared this with this young man, one of the things about Jesus is he doesn't ignore the broken, the lost. He doesn't ignore those who are desperate, who are diseased, who are ignored, who are mistreated. He doesn't look past them as everybody else does, what you might expect, but he comes down and he offers them rest. He embraces them. He embraces the broken, the weary, and says, come to me, and offers them rest. Yes, he's empathetic and he cares, but he also offers them the only response, the only solution to the anxiety and weariness and hopelessness that they had lived in. Jesus is the only hope. The Apostle Peter similarly writes, In 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of your anxiety, all of your worries, all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Cast them, cast them upon Jesus because he cares for you. He loves you. He invites you to cast your anxieties upon him. See, a lot of times people think that this this skewed perception of God that they that I, I have to I have to walk on eggshells and I have to put on a fake smile and pretend to be okay when I fall, when I go to God. That I, I can I, I just have to pretend like everything is just fine, but I can't show him my doubts or my my brokenness. I can't show him my real struggle. But God is a safe God for you to cast your anxieties on. You don't have to pretend to have it all together, but to actually say, Jesus, I am struggling. I am lost. I don't know what to do. I don't have any idea what you want out of this or what, I, what you are calling me to do or respond or how am I to move on. But the God of Scripture is not a God that you have to put up a false front for. He, his shoulders are broad enough. He is big enough to handle, to take your burden from you. And he invites you to do that, to cast your burden on him. You can safely just fall apart in his arms and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. And that's what he calls us to do. He already knows your heart. He already knows your situation. He knows what you're thinking anyway. It's not as though pretending as if everything is fine, is tricking him. He knows. But he wants you to openly, honestly, sincerely cast your anxiety on him and say, God, I need you. I need you. I'm desperate for you. And allow him to give you the rest and the peace and the hope that is only found in him. 
hope here and now in this life and hope beyond the grave as well. I want to share with you one of my what has become one of my favorite Old Testament passages that I, I, I've used in a lot of a lot of funeral services as it pertains to what we're talking about this morning, but in Isaiah 43, starting in verse 1. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. He who created you, he who formed you in your mother's womb, he who, de who designed you, who created all that is, he says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Did you hear that? He knows you and he loves you. He sees and knows where you are. And he has summoned you by name. He has a purpose for you. And he wants to be your hope. And what he offers is to give you his rest in and through these difficult times. And as if that alone weren't enough, we could just read that one verse. And what a great comfort and hope that gives us. But he, moved, he goes on beyond that in verse 2 to say, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And so you notice he doesn't say that there won't be water, that there won't be waves, that there won't be rivers that try to overtake you, that there won't be fire, that there won't be difficulties and challenges and pain in your life. A lot of times people think, well, if I just accept Jesus, then life will be easy. Everything will just go my way. Isn't that how it should work? We have that, that, that false idea, and then what we are, and then people are just distraught when they find that life is still tough. In fact, actually, maybe even more so in the sense that people will persecute you and treat you differently if you're faithfully living out God's word and standing out amongst the crowd. And, but when we actually read scripture, what we see is if, if we are following Jesus, the expectation is, we shouldn't be surprised to undergo difficulty because look at what Jesus went through. And if we're following him faithfully, we will endure challenges in this life. But we will not endure them alone because he offers to carry us through, to go with us, to give us strength beyond our own, to offer us his hope, his life, that we don't go through those dark times in life alone. In fact, what we'll come to recognize is that we have never been alone. We just may not have recognized that he was there with us in those times. Because he goes through the water, through the fire with us. We don't have time to, to, to jump into Daniel chapter uh, three this morning with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the firing furnace. But I just love that verse where King Nebuchadnezzar, after throwing them in the fire for not bowing down to him, and he says, didn't we only throw three in the fire? Who is the fourth? And that God doesn't sit outside the furnace comfortably and say, okay, you know, I have a, good luck in there. He steps into that furnace with them. 
that our God is the God who shines his light into the darkest places we will find ourselves in. And he and he alone offers us true hope. Not empty words that, again, are useful fictions that just help us cope but aren't really true, but he truly offers living hope. He is the only hope, the only real and sufficient response to the problem of human suffering. Not just because he knows, not just because he understands, not just because he himself endured, but because he offers to give us rest and offers us life anew, here and now and life beyond the grave. I want to, I want to look at one final scripture before we close. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness. In other words, the God of creation, the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure, the treasure of the truth of, God, of the gospel message, the hope and the life of the gospel message, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Just these fragile jars of clay, easily broken, in order that, in order to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. This eternal treasure, invincible treasure in these fragile jars of clay that we are. Continuing on in verse 8, we, as fragile jars of clay holding this treasure of the gospel truth, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, persecuted, not in despair excuse me, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Make no mistake, we will encounter opposition in this life. We will encounter difficulties and pain and suffering, and we will have questions and doubts and difficulties. But again, we don't go through any of that alone. That we have Jesus, the one and only hope for our life here and now and our life to come. This morning, um, I want to I want to invite you. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have our closing songs. But I want to invite you. A lot of times, people think that the altars are those are for people coming to Jesus, or those are for new Christians. But, but what about, but I, I've been a Christian for a long time, and what will people think when I go up to the altar? But we all have difficulties and challenges. These altars are for everyone, not just for the brand new believer. They're for all of us. And I want to invite you, extend to you the invitation of Jesus to come. All who are weary, cast your burden upon him. And he will give you rest. If God is, is laying it on your heart this morning, in these final songs, would you come forward so that we can pray for you? Would you come forward and cast your cares on him who is big enough to handle them? I'd love to pray for you. Would you bow with me? Lord, we come before you and thank you for who you are. That you are, you don't just have the hope, you are our hope. And that you didn't just from a safe distance just drop a message of, of truth, but that you came down and you endured suffering, pain. You were weary and tired and, and physically broken and rejected and betrayed by your closest friends. And Lord, you endured rejection from the very ones you laid down your life for. You know our pain and our suffering and you are the only answer. The only answer. Would you move in us? Would you inspire us and give us the strength 
to lay it all before you. To be open and honest and transparent and say, God, we need you. We need you. We can't carry this. We're not designed to carry this load on our own. And would you empower your church, your people, to be bearers of this hope that you have given us in jars of clay? It's in your name that we pray. Amen.